The Ghost Foot Monster by Murphy The events I describe are accurate. I will carry them with me for the rest of my life. These incidents occurred around midsummer in 2013 or 2014 in a small town in rural New Hampshire. My friend was present for both occurrences and witnessed the same things I did. The first event took place on a warm summer night. My friend and I lived in the same town, about two miles away. At the time, I had my license, and he did not. So I would drive to his house to hang out and play video games or pick him up and drive back to my place to hang out. Right down the hill from my place is this old textile mill that has been closed down for a while. Pretty much as long as I've ever seen it, it's been run down. And there have always been rumors going around about how people died working in the mills years back. And sometimes at night, if you look into the windows, you can see ghostly figures still dressed in the old-time clothing. Across the street from the mill is a dirt parking lot where telephone companies park their work trucks and grab them in the morning. I had just picked up my friend and drove back to my house. As we were driving by that dirt parking lot, we happened to notice something. The telephone company trucks were big, and you could see underneath them, on the other side of one of the trucks, I saw a pair of legs and feet as if someone were standing there motionless. The legs were very pale and stood out in the darkness. There were no shoes, just bare feet. It looked like the legs of a child around eight years old. As we kept driving and passed the truck, the feet and legs disappeared like they were never there. We were going fast enough that they could not have run off before we passed them if that was an actual person. I asked my friend if he had just seen that thinking I might have been crazy. You mean the white legs and the feet? He asked. To this day, I, I still hope it was our imagination playing tricks on us. But sometimes I wonder if a child may have died working in the mill many years ago when child labor was legal. This last event happened to me and my friend. It was late at night and I was driving home after the movies. Let me remind you that I live in a very rural, woodsy town. We were on this stretch of road close to this place where we did see the ghost legs originally with woods on either side and we were not driving very fast as the speed limit for that road is only 20 miles per hour because it is very windy. Just remembering this next part sends chills down my spine as I write this. This thing flies over the road just above the tree line as we drive. It flew next to a street light lighting the creature well. At first I thought it was some type of bird, but as more of it appeared by the light of the street, I realized this thing was much too large to be a, any bird of any type. The creature we saw had the body roughly the shape of the size of a large wolf, but with short fur. It had bat-like wings big enough to support its weight and size. Unlike a bird, the creature had front and back legs and a tail. Luckily, I didn't see it long enough to get a good description of its head or face, and I'm glad I didn't, because I was already completely paralyzed with fear. Later, my friend claimed it had red eyes. My friend and I did not say a single word the whole time this happened. The rest of the way to the house, we said nothing. When we finally pulled into his driveway, I shut off the car, and we both just silently started freaking out. I was hoping I was going crazy. And to this day, I would think I was, but someone saw the exact creature I did. We went inside and told his brother, who thought we were absolutely crazy. After that, we said nothing to anyone for a long time because who would believe us? To this day, I don't know what kind of creature we saw that night. Just thinking about it, going to the woods in that town now scares me. If anyone has any idea what it might have been, or has any strange creature stories around New England, I would love to hear about it in the comments. Shadow Creature in My Home by Ashes Fallen I am a 20 year old girl, and I've been in tune with the paranormal my entire life. 
Admittedly, I have become slightly obsessed, not in the summoning demons way, but more with too much research and spending my free time and all day at work if I'm honest, listening to podcasts like this one. I have many stories to tell, but I decided to start with one that has been weighing on me for quite some time. I moved into a new place in December of 2017 with my new roommate, who we will call Nikki. When we moved in, I felt a massive weight off my shoulders because for the first time, I didn't feel any pressure in my home. Skip forward to May, and things had been going pretty well when we found out a family friend who was 16, we'll call her Morgan, didn't have a place to live, so we invited her to stay with us. I had known this kid for roughly 15 years and knew she came from a messed up family. She told us her dad was a Satanist and had cast some sort of curse on her, and now she was being followed by what she described as a shadow creature. With my past of the paranormal, I believed her but didn't really think anything of it and didn't want to take it too seriously as obviously we had some real emotional issues going on here. A few weeks passed and little inconveniences occurred such as our coffee table being moved or mail being scattered across the floor. We have cats so I didn't really think that much of it, but I was pretty annoyed about it. This kept happening, then gradually started getting weirder like our laundry detergent being poured out under the dining room table, and the empty bottle was set up in the middle of the puddle. At around the same time, both Morgan and Nikki started having issues with sleep paralysis. Nikki used to get it all the time as a kid, but hadn't in years. The strange thing was that despite having separate experiences, both girls claimed to see the same thing a child-sized black figure. The body was small, the head was too big, the hands were too long. It was always the same description. They couldn't see any other features, just a black outline. Luckily, I didn't have sleep paralysis, and I never have in my life, so I mistakenly thought I was safe. One night, I was home alone, and I was in a deep, depressing mood. Everything in the house just felt so heavy that I took a nap on the couch. When I woke up, I couldn't breathe. I felt like someone was pushing on my chest. So I sat up, and the pressure was gone. Then I noticed the room was dark. Like, unnaturally dark. My TV and the hall light were on, so there was no reason for my little portion of the living room to feel so enveloped in black. I decided to not really think about it, turn the TV up, and started scrolling through my phone. I heard heavy footfall from the kitchen directly behind me a moment later. It sounded like a full-grown man. I thought someone had come into the house while I was asleep because we always left the sliding glass door in the kitchen unlocked. I know it wasn't the best thing to do, but I've changed since then. Too afraid to turn around and look, I took out my phone and went to Snapchat. I turned on my flash on my screen and everything went completely black when I switched to the front-facing camera. My flash wouldn't work anymore, so I drew the courage to turn around. I saw nothing, and instantly the room was light again. I grabbed my keys and left until my roommate was off work. A couple of days had passed, and my roommate and I burned sage, oiled all the entrances, and told whatever was in the house that it was not welcome and had to leave. I don't really know where I truly fall on things like this, but I was willing to try anything. I was hoping that would be the end of it, and we didn't have any more things moved, Morgan had moved in with her brother, and the house seemed a bit lighter, except Nikki was still experiencing some pretty extreme sleep paralysis almost every single night. Skip forward a few weeks and I'm laying in bed with my two cats. It's somewhere around 3am and I heard pods and pans moving in the kitchen. My cats woke up and started growling and hissing which is out of character for them, so I grabbed my gun and checked every inch and corner of the house. Nikki was still sleeping. So I returned to my room, thinking it could have been maybe her cat, who likes to hide in the cupboards from time to time. Three loud bangs made me jump so high the second I shut the door that I fell back onto my bed. I yelled for the thing to go away. I didn't want it to hear, and it had to leave. What felt like minutes later, I opened the door and my older cat ran out, turned into the kitchen, and screamed like she was hurt. 
I looked at her for like an hour and I couldn't find anything wrong with her. I went to bed crying because she was acting weird after that. The following day, I woke up and everybody was asleep beside me normally. Nobody seemed harmed. It just seemed like everybody was a bit freaked out. I woke up my roommate and told her about the night before. She explained that she had been awake when I got up and heard the three loud bangs herself but was way too afraid to get out of bed. We oiled again and brought in her mother who worked at the church and she blessed the house. Not too long after Morgan's little brother moved in with me, everything kind of seemed to cease. It makes me wonder if Morgan's dad did curse her. He always told his three daughters they were mistakes and that he only intended to have two sons. That might explain everything. After she moved in with her older brother, it didn't really bother her anymore, and when her younger brother came to stay with me, the problem seemed to just move away entirely. All I know is whatever it was, it was really negative. My depression had never been worse, and we were constantly arguing in the house. I'm just glad it's over. Something in the Bighorn Mountains by Cam I was younger when this story occurred. Of course, all the adults say kids have a wild imagination, even though my buddy and I swore up and down that this had happened. Anywho, let's get to the story. It was toward the end of the week, and my mom and her boyfriend at the time I wanted to go up the mountain to his family's cabin. I live north of Wyoming where the Bighorn Mountains reside. As a 12 year old, I asked my mom if I could bring my buddy. For his safety, his name will be Nick. I called Nick and asked if he wanted to go to the cabin for the weekend. He had to ask his mom and with our moms being close since they were younger, she said yes. Once we got everything in my mom's boyfriend's pickup, we went ahead and picked him up. As he hopped into the back of the truck, we talked about the general things that typically we would talk about, school, girls, etc. As we got to the cabin on the first day, nothing really major happened. We went four-wheeling and had hot dogs and s'mores, and the first night came and went without incident. The start of the next day is when things began to get a little spooky. The day went normal as much as it could. Towards the afternoon, we stayed around the cabin, my mom kicked us out of the place after lunch. We hiked around the house and we discussed a few different things such as movies, shows, Call of Duty, etc. As well as grabbing a stick and pretending to be in Call of Duty. As weird as it may have sounded. Towards dusk, I showed him the treehouse roughly 70 to 80 yards away from the cabin. The treehouse is a triangular platform 10 feet up in the air made of 2x4s and a makeshift ladder. The platform is between three trees on each point in a triangle shape, with rails to help with safety and all that. We had our legs dangling from the platform, talking again with the occasional silence between us talking. The forest became dead, which is a natural sign of a predator being around, which became a big red flag with both of us knowing that, especially with us going hunting every fall. We ended up getting the chills. Nick broke the silence. Hey, do you, do you see that? As he struggles to get the sentence out. So that's all the light we had. A feeling of fight or flight. With the sun setting and it being all the light we had, that feeling of fight or flight came through our bodies. We began to hear something crashing through the brush. And in the distance, we saw what I can only describe as a giant, hairy humanoid creature peering at us from behind a tree. That was roughly 50 feet away from us. It was at least 9 feet tall. Once I realized what it could be, the hair on the back of our neck stood up immediately. Our first mistake was looking at each other as shock kicked in. We looked back at where the creature was and now it was a bit closer. It was kind of like suspense from those movies in like Jurassic Park when the raptor broke through the glass. We both hopped off and as I'm looking back and forth between Nick and the creature, he hopped down and ran to the meadow in front of the cabin, closer to where we were. Looking back at the beast, I saw it was about 30 yards away. Fear filled my body and I shook without looking away from the beast. I scooted my butt over as 
I was getting ready to run when I happened to look up and saw this thing face to face. I saw it in its full glory, hair covered head to toe with a brown and blonde mixture of color. With the setting sun putting an orange tint to it, I ended up freaking out as though I had seen death itself. I jumped to the ground rolling as I hit it, getting up and booking it to the same meadow as my friend. Nick was waiting there already. As I'm running, I hear twigs and sticks breaking behind us. I knew this thing was chasing me. Once I got closer to the meadow, I saw Nick telling me to run. As I got to him, I looked back and saw the creature in the tree line. As we were staring at it, it was staring right back. It did something we will never forget. With us catching our breath, we heard it. It was like a loud roar. We ended up booking it to the front of the cabin, slamming the door shut, and my mom and her boyfriend looked at us puzzled. They were asking us questions and we tried to answer, but as I said, they thought we were crazy. After dinner and having some s'mores, we ended up going to bed. The cabin had an open area upstairs, where the six beds were for us kids to hang out in. Towards the back of the upstairs is a screen door. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night to a sound of scratching on wood. The light outside the screen never turns off. I saw a hand scraping the deck floor outside. I freaked out because I swear it was the same hand from that creature. Something is prowling my campsite. Bye. Anonymous. First off, I want to thank you for telling the first story I submitted a few months back. You did a wonderful job, and I'm very grateful you decided to tell it. This next story takes place in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. I had just came back from my second Iraq deployment, and had been assigned to the USA Air Ambulance Detachment at Fort Drum, New York. Seven months later, our unit was transferred to Yakima Training Center in Yakima, Washington. The constant deployment and change put a great deal of strain on an already weak marriage, resulting in her moving back to live with her folks in New Hampshire. I was depressed about it, and when a four-day weekend came up, I decided to head into the mountains for a little time for myself. The road was rough. Going as soon as I left the highway, I kept driving in my 2000 Ford F-150 until I saw another road about 10 miles away from the highway. This road was overgrown and looked like it hadn't been used for some time. Since my intention was to completely escape away from people for a few days, I took it. The road was hardly wide enough for my truck. I went all the way and over a ridge into a quiet field in the middle of the woods. Small steam made its way through the center. I pulled off the road and decided to make a camp. Within a short period of time, a campfire was made and the back of my truck was set up for sleeping. I had an old camper shell and an inflatable mattress with blankets and such. I made a dinner of steak and potatoes and watched the sun disappear below the horizon. It was beautiful out there. No sounds of cars or anything. I felt like I honestly had the whole world to myself, and I felt good for the first time in a long time. A few drinks later of single malt scotch, I decided to go to bed and get some sleep for an early start the next day. I had planned to do some fishing and maybe have a small hike. The weather was cool and the stars and the moon were clear. I fell asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. A few hours later, though, I was woke up to a growl outside my truck. Heavy footsteps circled around my vehicle, and then I heard a high-pitched scream. I normally, at the sound of being paranoid, carry a handgun while camping, and this time was no different. I reached over and unholstered my Charter Arms Undercover 38 Special and sat with my back to the cab. It was still circling the vehicle, and I managed to glimpse it through the side camper window. A dark and mysterious looking woman and a short plump man were staring at my vehicle. They did not look armed, so I decided to go ask them what they wanted. I got out of the truck and looked in the direction I had seen them, but there was nothing. I searched the entire area around the site. Nothing. I got back in the truck and locked the door. It must have been my imagination, I told myself, and a few hours later, I eventually passed out again. I again awoke to the truck rocking and screaming and hollering in the early morning as a person was hitting my camper shell repeatedly and yelling obscenities. I did not want to remain there any longer. I slid through the sliding window in my cab, started the truck, and got the heck out of there. 
when my headlights came on, I saw a circle of people in robes surrounding me. I threw the truck into reverse and punched it out of there. They jumped out of the way as I barreled into reverse through their circle and took off like a bat out of hell, with them running behind me on foot. Then I got to the main road. I floored it out of there. Unfortunately, a highway patrolman was right there, and I was pulled over. He came to my window, and after I related the story of what happened, he told me that area I was in was home to a religious cult. The road I went up to was supposed to have a no trespassing sign and a chain. I'm happy nothing more sinister happened. Nicolette National Forest Terror by Luke Ape. A little background before we begin. Everyone says the same thing. I'm an avid outdoorsman. I hunt, fish, camp, hike, and kayak. My buddy is not an outdoorsman. He goes party camping with me, and that's about it. We have never experienced anything like what I'm about to tell you. This happened in 2018. The day before, we were camping at a lake in the Nicolette National Forest in northern Wisconsin. The trees were changing color at the time, and the leaves were starting to fall. It was freezing at night, being October. My buddy got cold quickly and drove around in the mornings to warm up. We would go into town to get gas and supplies, mainly beer. There needed to be more to do at our campground, and with no hiking or activities, day drinking is kind of what we relied on, listening to music and talking about party camping. The next day was going to be an overcast, rainy day, so we decided to spend it by driving around, looking at other campgrounds and scouting them out for other trips. We quote unquote partied that night and went to bed late. Everything was normal. We heard wolves, owls, loons, and all the other good stuff. But after a while, we heard nothing. Just pure quiet. It was peaceful. It started raining early the next day. Just a drizzle at first, but enough to make camping a pain. We got up late, hung over and cold. We dressed in our hiking gear and jumped in the car to get warm. We left the lake campsite a little after noon to check out the other campgrounds. It was about five miles to the next one and basically on the highway without privacy. We would generally check them out, but it started raining very hard. We stayed in the car, marking down the campsites we liked and the ones we didn't. This one we didn't really particularly like. Now the thing about this national forest is there are campsites and campgrounds spread out absolutely everywhere. They need to be connected in some sort of way. So, you have to get on the highway, find a little sign that says campsites this way, and then drive down a dirt road for 10 to 15 minutes to find them. We made it to about 8 before 5 o'clock. We were at the entrance of what was going to be our last one for the day. It said the road was 15 miles. I went slowly, not trying to kick too many rocks up into my car. The road was honestly pretty eerie. The trees made the street look like we were going down a cave. A couple of minutes in and the rain had stopped. At the campsites, there was no one there. It was beginning to get dark, we had been in the car all day and we were ready to get out and stretch our legs. We parked at the first campsite and got out. The birds were singing their lullabies and everything was still. There were five campsites in a circular clearing with thick trees all around. The sites were open to each other and could have been better for my camping. Only if you rented all the sites. Honestly, we walked around the circle and noticed a sign that said group camp pointing up a trail. We started down the gravel path full of wet leaves to the site. After walking for some time, I realized it wasn't even close. I raised this concern with my buddy, but we wanted to see the site anyway. It was almost dark out, but we could still see rather well. I noticed the birds had stopped singing at this point. It was a hushed tone in the forest. All we heard was our own footsteps. We made it to the group side after walking for quite a few minutes. It was still and nothing was moving. We were at the end of the trail looking into the area. The hair on the back of my neck started to stand up and my skin crawled. Standing about 30 feet to our left was a very massive, dark haired creature. I was frozen with fear. My buddy hadn't noticed it yet and was still walking. I said his name quietly. He must have known something was wrong because he stopped and turned to his left immediately. We were both frozen. I was standing there what felt like minutes, but it couldn't have been more than a few seconds. I knew what it was, but 
Uh, in my head, I was saying they weren't real. I couldn't even speak. Then, it started slowly moving towards us. It started yelling some deep-throaty gibberish at us. Against all my instincts to hold my ground and fight back, we ran for it. It ran with us, and it was still screaming. We kept running for our lives. It was running parallel to us. Its scream was replaced by what I can only describe as a deep, throaty huffing noise. It was crashing through the dead brush, keeping up with us effortlessly. We were running, trying not to slip on the leaves or, or just die. We saw the car and had hope. As soon as we got to the clearing, it stopped. It hit a tree, more like it punched through a tree. We heard a huge crack and crash. We were almost to the car when this massive tree hit the ground next to us. We then listened to what can only be described as a great ape beating its chest in triumph while screaming. We jumped in the car and sped away. The rest was a blur. We got back to the campground, packed up and left at night. We never spoke about it again and haven't talked about it since. I'm almost entirely possible what we experienced that day was a Bigfoot. Small Appalachian Town by Kenny B. This event took place back when I was in college and occurred way before there were things like cell phones. I was an undergraduate then and attended a school in the Appalachian Mountains. The school was in a small town and I soon realized that the townies, that is people who grew up there, didn't care much for us students. I was a junior then and it happened during a cold winter. I heard a story about a certain townie who frequented a popular bar called The Club. It was a place frequented by both students and townies. As the story goes, this guy comes out on a Saturday evening to pick fights with students. That past weekend, he had sat down at the table, uninvited, where a group of students were drinking beer. He just sat there, silent and unwelcome. Eventually, he grabbed the thigh of a male student. He then assaulted them when the student gripped him by the arm and told him to let them go. Supposedly, the students all had to go to the hospital due to injuries sustained during the beating. Being a townie, the owner didn't do anything about it either. The following Saturday night rolled around and I told my buddies to let's teach this jerk a lesson. My dad raised me not to be a victim and to look out for my friends. I played pool and poker to help myself through school, so I knew how to handle myself. Having heard the townie liked to punch his victims in the solar plexus, I got some magazines and taped them around my torso with a roll of electrical tape. I also got an empty coke bottle and put it in my jacket pocket. I waited until around 10 p.m., then headed over to the bar, got a table, leaving one chair empty beside me. We were enjoying a cold pitcher of Pabst when one of my friends told me he was there. We made sure not to look at him and kept on drinking. Eventually, he came over and sat beside me in the empty chair. Casually, I turned to look at him and smiled. Sure enough, he immediately grabbed my leg. Hey there, fella, he said, smiling. I looked at him smiling back as I took another sip of beer. He had a rugged grip on my thigh as he stared back at me, not saying a word. Well, you certainly aren't a shy one. I said, and all my friends laughed. The bar had grown silent. Everyone around us was watching. I had a nice pinch of Copenhagen snuff between my cheek and gums. I spit it into one of his eyes, which caused him to close both of his eyes involuntarily. Immediately, I punched him in the throat as hard as I could, knocking the creep backward. He fell out of his seat, landing flat on his ass. Take it outside, yelled the owner from behind the bar. We stepped out into the back alley, followed by the townie. His eyes blazed with anger, and he quickly came towards me. He took a swing, which I blocked as I pulled out the coke bottle, gripping it by the neck. I swung back hard, landing a savage blow against his thick skull. It connected with a satisfying thud. His head snapped back, and he stumbled. I kicked his legs out from under him. Then we circled him and started kicking him with our steel-toed Doc Martens. He tried to get up but we just kept kicking him as hard as we could, working up a good sweat. He must have tried not to yell or scream, but soon enough he started crying like a baby. This went on for quite a while until we eventually heard sirens approaching. Let's go, I shouted, and we leaped out of there as fast as we could. Later, we were told an ambulance had come to the bar to cart off the unconscious townie on a stretcher. We didn't return to the club anytime soon again. 
One time the following year, I'm pretty sure I saw the townie sitting in a wheelchair beside the bar. He looked like him, but wasn't so big anymore and trembled a lot. He looked my way eventually and immediately broke eye contact. He never said one word either. Oh well, I thought. He had brought it on himself. There are consequences to your actions, I guess, but I do kind of feel bad. Tales from the Appalachia by Illustrious Scale 40 The story I'm about to share takes place on two different occasions. My grandparents live in rural southern Ohio near the edge of the Appalachian Trail. Growing up, you always heard ghost stories about what happens out there when the sun goes down. It's vital to describe the layout of my parents' property so everyone understands this story. My grandparents' house sits on five acres, surrounded by thick woods all around. On the property, seven different trails lead you around my grandparents' house which we usually used for hunting and other activities. One day, my brother and I decided to walk the trails. We enjoyed riding a four-wheeler and taking in the necessary scenery that we always loved. My grandparents' property was incredibly secluded. There were no neighbors for miles, and the only property that backed up to theirs was owned by the government, and they were just used for tree sanctuaries and nature preserves. There was a trail that we often would use that split into two other trails. The trail to the left loops you back around to the house, and the other trail to the right takes you down to the creek, where you can sit and watch all kinds of wildlife. My brother and I decided we wanted to go down to the creek and watch for animals while also looking for remarkable rocks that I love to collect all the time. The only way to get down the creek at the split is to walk, as the four-wheeler is too big to fit through the thick brush and trees on that specific trail. So we ditched the four-wheeler and took off on foot. The trail down to the creek is about a mile long. The sun shone through the trees and it was crisp. It was a fall evening with a slight breeze. My brother and I wasted no time until we finally reached the creek. As I said, we walked alongside the water for about 15 minutes, looking for cool rocks. As we were walking, we stumbled across a broken down shed that neither my brother nor I had ever seen before. It's important to mention that my grandparents' property has markers, letting everyone know where their property begins and ends. Standing on the left side of the creek, the shed was on the opposite side. My brother and I looked at each other with confused looks, but eventually, my brother got distracted by something else and continued his walk down the creek, but not me. I felt myself fall into some sort of trance and I felt as if I needed to go inside. I yelled for my brother to return and said, Jay, I think we should check this out some more. Something inside me wants me to go inside. My brother has never really been a fan of anything remotely scary. Seeing this rundown shed that looked to be falling apart did not interest him. My brother told me, Honestly dude, this one just screams one of those scary movie situations and I want no part of it. We are not going in there. I chuckled because he was right. Something, something was telling me to go in there, but I also knew it probably wasn't the best idea as the sun was starting to set. My brother and I collected our rock findings and returned to the house. This next part happened the following weekend. My boyfriend came out to visit at the time. While he was there, I mentioned that my brother and I had stumbled across a creepy shed on the property that we had never seen before. He became highly interested as I described my desire to go inside. I told him how compelled I was to the building. That's all it took before we were out the door and returning to the creek. My brother stayed behind saying, if you guys don't come back, I told you so. My ex-boyfriend and I laughed, yeah right. We had overalls and flashlights as we didn't take the four-wheeler and decided to walk to the whole way down. We had flashlights because when we left, we knew we only had about two hours until the sun went down. Eventually, we made it down to the creek. We walked the same way my brother and I did the previous week, and to my shock and disbelief, there was no shed there. I started frantically looking around, saying, What? How? I swear it was here. My boyfriend at the time and I decided to walk a little further, venturing away from my grandparents' house. Still, there was no sign of the shed anywhere. We hadn't realized how long we had been out there, and the sun maybe had 15 more minutes of light left for the day. 
so I was so determined to prove myself right that I had seen this shed with my own eyes. We pull out our flashlights, jump across the bank on the other side of the creek, and begin walking back the way we came. I hoped I had just missed it on the way down, as my ex and I were talking. The sun was completely down at this point. As we were walking and talking, everything falls silent, including my ex. We were mid-conversation, so I did the same when I heard him stop dead in his tracks. I started asking questions. You know, what is it? What's going on? What he said next sent chills down my spine. I want you to listen to me very closely. When I count to three, we are going to jump to the other side of the creek. And we are going to run fast and as fast as we can and not stop at all until we get back. But don't look back. Don't say anything. Okay? My heart fell to my stomach. And I just didn't question him. I just prepared myself to run. One, two, three. We sprinted as fast as we could. I was in front of my ex and I could hear him wincing in pain, but I heard more than just our running. There was something chasing us. We ditched the idea of running a mile back to the trail and ran straight through the woods. When we returned to the house, we were gasping for air, covered in scratches from running through thick brush. We walked through the front door, and I was shocked that I could not answer my grandparents' questions. My boyfriend was gripping his back and wincing in pain. My grandma lifted his shirt and looked at his back. There were three long lashes stemming from his shoulder down to his lower back. It looked like something had, like, swung at him or something and scratched him. I was in a shocked state, to say the least. From one Appalachian to another, don't go looking for something that you don't want to find. If anyone knows what this could have been, please let me know in the comments down below. This occurrence still keeps me up at night when I think about it. Strange Camping Experience by Del Teco I've never had paranormal experiences, but I can't really explain this one. I'm in college, and seven other people from my school and I went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year, and it was cold, and everything was still pretty much dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, we set up camp at the backpacking campsite. There were a couple of other groups of people as well, so we weren't entirely alone. A few of them were friendly older couples and two college-aged girls. Everyone was relatively spread out, so we set up camp further away. I have always sensed the energy of places and the energy in this area wasn't great. It was almost spooky, eerie, if you will. Each of us had individual, one-person tents and we formed a cluster at the site. With my tent in the back so no one was behind me, our cluster was next to the forest because the backpacking site was like a big cleared off square in the middle of the trees. Fast forward, I'm dead asleep, it's sometime around 2am and I wake up to leaves crunching right behind my tent. I hear footsteps walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be any deer or dog. It sounded just like two legs, and I cannot make this up. This creature, this person, whatever it was, circled my tent for long periods of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of my tent and then just stopping, and then would move on to walking around the rest of our camps. I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth when it was close to my tent, like a light heaving. I began to shake. I was too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this occurred for hours, and it seemed like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I saw an illuminated shape from my tent. Although I couldn't tell where it was or how this light was coming in, I, I was just too terrified to move. It was like a warm glow. I might have assumed it was someone's flashlight except no one was moving. I was paralyzed in fear and simply couldn't believe it was any animal. At some point, I fell asleep due to sheer exhaustion, but I could hear the heavy footsteps circling. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it, 
and my leader admitted she did hear footsteps and weird noises as well. Realizing it was bizarre, and she should have gone out and investigated it, but she had been a bit dizzy from walking and being in the heat all day. One of the boys in the group said he also noticed that light come on, but thought it was just somebody else going to the bathroom. Not a single person in this group went up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light all night. I've heard things about the Appalachian regions being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. Has anybody else had a similar experience? I'd love to know. Appalachian Ghost Story by Brian H. When I was a kid, in my early preteens to be exact, I was pretty timid. We lived in a mobile home in rural Appalachia, and whenever I heard my stepdad wake up and make breakfast in the wee hours of the morning, I would creep out of my bedroom and scurry across the house so that I could climb in bed with my mom. This morning, at around 3.30 a.m., my mom had gotten up with my stepdad. She told me to climb into bed. She would be there later. So I did as I was told. I'm unsure of how much time had passed, but something woke me up. It was still dark out. Something just felt weird. When I pried my eyes open, a little girl stood by the edge of the bed. Her face was obscured by dark, dirty, almost singed looking hair. She wore what looked like a feed sack dress. I rubbed my eyes, but the little girl was still there. I rolled over and turned back around and then she was gone. It was odd that I didn't freak out because at that age I was honestly scared of my own shadow but I decided that it must have been just some sort of weird dream and I went back to bed. When I woke up later that morning, I told my mom about it and she would typically tell me what other mothers would tell their children when they have a nightmare. But this time, she didn't. Instead of reassuring me that it was just a bad dream, she grew silent. I felt uncomfortable, but I didn't ask any more questions until a pastor showed up at the house the next day. The old man had the posture of a candy cane, and I thought he would never manage it as he would struggle to hang prayer cloths above the doors. I knew something was up. My mom was not particularly religious. After the elderly gentleman left, I pressed my mom harder. She revealed that my stepdad had been seeing the same thing for weeks. She also began to tell me that through some research, my aunt and grandma had discovered that the place where our home was was a location of a hay barn fire in the 1930s. The fire was presumably started by a little girl, who could have been the same age as the apparition that we were encountering, and they believe her younger brother was involved as well. They both perished in the fire. The area had been a coal camp, typically places full of tragedy and poverty, during the early mid to 1900s. The visits from the little girl stopped after this. I'm trying to understand why, I didn't feel that whatever I was seeing was particularly malicious, and I think that's the reason I didn't feel scared. However, later that year my stepdad went ginseng hunting several times around our house, and happened upon a grove of vegetation. He said that he could tell there was something underneath all the plants so he cleared it off, only to find what he believes to be the little girl's grave. Black Eyed Children Encounter by Anonymous. I encountered the black eyed children over a decade ago in rural Appalachia. This has always, always kind of freaked me out. We've kept in touch to this day, but definitely distanced me from this friend. We were at a local state park between 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. I remember we were parked alongside the woods and some picnic tables. It was pretty desolate. We were technically trespassing. I was a 17-year-old female, and my friend was a 17-year-old male. What we were doing there, you can leave to your imagination. As our curfews were approaching and we were finishing up our time together, we experienced a very ominous feeling. He was in the driver's seat preparing to start the car and pull off. The car didn't start, and we sort of laughed it off as it wasn't the first time. Suddenly, to the right on the passenger side where I was sitting, we saw faint lights coming out of the woods. The ominous feeling intensified, emerging from the woods, and there were four to five children younger than us appearing to be seven to eleven years old. 
I'm not going to claim they had black eyes, but they were dark. And I don't remember, as I was pretty shook. I didn't read much about black eyed children encounters, lore, and phenomenon until years after this, which described everything else that we experienced. All I can say is they were not normal. They didn't belong. The cabins at the park were not occupied. As far as I know, they weren't even getting rented out until the autumn and winter time. We were miles from the park's hotel, and there were no adults. We were literally the only people here. They were so absolutely out of place. What were the lights? I don't know. But the closest thing I can compare them to are glow sticks. It was as if they opened a package of those novelty glow sticks, which included bracelets, necklaces, or wands. But it wasn't like they were having fun and wasting time. They just stopped, stood there, and stared at us. He tried asking what they were doing here, if they were lost, and where their parents were, but we got no response. The oldest looking child, uh, probably a bit heavy set with a gray hoodie on, approached the vehicle in front of where the passenger headlight corner would be. My friend started to get freaked out at this moment. He locked the doors and said, hell no, we gotta go. Eventually, we got the car started. The children never really moved, and the kid stayed in front of the vehicle. My friend eventually yells to the kid, I'm going to run you over, and the boy slowly backed away, raising his arms and pointing at us as we left. I didn't look back. I don't know what the heck we experienced that night. Delaware Nature Preserve Creepiness by Kmart Before Dawn For 13 years, my home nestled in southern Delaware, enveloped me in a serene, woodsy embrace. A 15-minute drive wound through quiet lanes to the nearest small town, while the closest small city beckoned 40 minutes away. Surrounding my house, a sprawling nature preserve punctuated by the occasional hunter's cabin offered a playground of adventure. As a child, I spent countless hours exploring its hidden corners, forging trails through thickets and underbrush. One area held a special place in my heart though, a secluded expanse of abandoned fields and pine forest about a half mile from my childhood home. Accessible only by a rugged vehicle trail, this sanctuary boasted a tiny pond shimmering amidst towering pines. Large pieces of concrete fence cordoned off its perimeter, preserving its tranquility from motorized intrusion. The place was sacred to me, a haven where I'd often unearth treasures like unique rocks and intriguing animal bones, nurturing my fascination with natural history. Years later, I returned with my fiancé, eager to share this enchanted realm. The forest greeted us with its timeless embrace, sunlight filtering through the canopy to dapple the earth in patches of warmth. We ventured out towards the familiar pond, tracing the vehicle's trail winding path with renewed anticipation. Our search for natural curiosities began innocently enough, but soon took an unexpected turn. Amongst the pine needles and mossy ground, scattered remnants caught our eye. Bones. Fragments of what I would assume were deer skeletons lay strewn in a small clearing. Some pieces gleamed white against the forest floor, stark against the backdrop of deep green. Intrigued yet uneasy, we examined the remains. Partial skulls, rib bones, and vertebrae laid out within a six-foot radius. These were not the orderly remains left behind by some hunters who typically field dressed their kills elsewhere in the preserve. No, these were fragments, a mysterious puzzle of decay and something that defied an easy explanation. Disquiet settled over us as we knelt amidst the eerie tableau. The forest, which once hummed with the rustle of leaves and distant wildlife, now seemed hushed unnaturally still. Gone were the familiar echoes of distant trains that occasionally cut through the air, leaving a silence thick enough to touch. Unease prickling at our senses, we exchanged nervous glances. What exactly had brought these scattered bones to this secluded haven? Who, or what, had laid them out so deliberately, defying the natural order of the preserve? With a mutual understanding, 
we abandoned our search and hastened our way back along the trail, footsteps quickening as if eager to leave this mystery behind. The once familiar woods, now draped in shadows that seemed to whisper ancient secrets, urged us toward the safety of my car. Driving away, the weight of the unexplained hung heavy in the air. We vowed silently that that eerie, clearing, undisturbed was best left alone. Its mysteries unsolved, a haunting reminder of the thin veil separating the known from the unknowable in the heart of the wild. My Creepiest Experience by Anonymous Whether we accept it or not, we all have experienced something creepy, weird, or even paranormal, if we accept it or not. You see a dog, you blink, it's not there. You hear things banging when you're home alone. Doors move, voices talk to you, a ghost possesses you, old ladies or teenagers who aren't there, we've all seen it. It all has to start somewhere, and mine is probably the freakiest I have been through, or anything like that. Anyway, my first experience with the paranormal was when I was just seven years old. Luckily, or unluckily, I have a sharp memory of it, and I remember it well. In my old house, my parents wanted me to understand God well since we were Christians. So, they got me a tiny angel doll that lights up at night. The last time I liked that thing was day one. It was creepy and too bright to fall asleep, and anyone reading this can agree that any doll is weird, especially lifelike ones. It's so lifelike, it has such a humanoid face, but a fake chest and arms. So after I learned how the technology actually worked, I quickly unplugged the doll with electricity from the plugs and fell asleep. I dreamed of something chasing me and promptly woke up in a sweat with my heart racing. I looked around the room and noticed light flooding in a weird fashion. After looking around curiously, it dawned on me where it came from. Then a thought occurred. I... I did unplug the light, right? But the doll didn't want to be unplugged, and it was glowing brighter than it ever had before. I did what any sane person would do, I hid under my covers. But then, another thought came over me that I only understood once I learned about ghosts. The doll typically changes colors like peaceful ones, like green, yellow, blue, etc. But this time, it stayed on one particular color. It was pure red, which still freaks me out to this day. After that horrid night, I dared to ask my parents to get rid of the doll, and they admitted that it, it creeped them out as well. So I put the doll in my closet, and the heaviest object in my room over the door and an old beanbag chair in front of that, just for extra protection to make sure it couldn't get out. That night, the doll also didn't want to be locked away. I saw shadows walking by and whispers that I couldn't make any sense of. After that experience, I had nightmares for weeks, and every now and then, I would see the shadow of that angel. I prayed and hoped that they would go away, and my prayers were answered. We moved out and gave the house to some obnoxious neighbor. At the last minute, I thought I had removed the doll and left it there. But three years ago, I was rummaging around in my new house when I found the doll. The logical explanation is my parents found it and put it back, but I have a hunch that it wasn't the case. I think it's something more paranormal. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Maybe it's my imagination. Maybe it's something more serious. Let me know in the comments if you want me to tell you more about my ghostly experiences. The Murder of Mary Allen by S.D. News Mary Allen was a 73-year-old widow who had lived alone in her residence on Governor Prince Boulevard for many years. This was a smaller city known as Claymont, Delaware. She was known for her kind heart and dedication. Mary was a beloved figure in her community. She had a green thumb and took pride in her garden, where she spent mornings tending to her roses and other plants. Her garden was a source of joy and beautiful testament to her hard work and passion. Mary's life was marked by routine and simplicity. She was a reliable and punctual employee, 
which made her unexplained absence from work on the morning of July 24, 1975, all the more alarming. Despite her advanced age, Mary maintained an active lifestyle, often seen by neighbors walking around her yard or chatting with friends. Her friendly demeanor and open-door policy reflected her trust in the community, a trust that would ultimately be betrayed. On the morning of July 24, 1975, Mary's absence from work raised immediate concerns. Her employer, knowing Mary's impeccable attendance record, became worried and contacted her son to inform him that she had not shown up. This was out of character for Mary, who was known for her dependability. Concerned, Mary's daughter-in-law wanted to check in on her. Arriving at Mary's home around 4 p.m., she found the house eerily quiet. As she entered the home, she called out for Mary but received no response. Her heart pounded as she made her way through the house, finally reaching the bedroom where she discovered Mary's lifeless body. Mary Allen was found in her front bedroom, brutally stabbed to death. The scene was gruesome, and it was evident that she had been attacked with great violence. The investigation revealed that her killer or killers had entered the house through an unlocked back door sometime between 8 p.m. on July 23rd and 10 a.m. on July 24th. It appeared that Mary had been initially attacked in the bathroom while she was getting dressed. She was then dragged to the front bedroom. She was then repeatedly stabbed. Despite the ferocity of the attack, there were no signs of any SA, and nothing appeared to have been stolen from the home. This absence of theft or essay added to the mystery and even more horror of the crime, suggesting a deeply personal motive or a level of brutality that was inexplicable to those who knew her. The investigation into Mary's murder was challenging from the start, to say the least. Neighbors reported hearing nothing unusual during the night, and there were no witnesses to the crime. One neighbor mentioned having a brief conversation with Mary the evening before. Nothing that she seemed, you know, unnormal. She said that they were more concerned about the potential need to move her beloved roses due to the street widening plan than anything else. Mary's trusting nature, which led her to often leave her back door unlocked or ajar, unfortunately provided easy access for the killer. The lack of defensive wounds suggested that Mary might have been taken by surprise, unable to fend off her attacker. The murder of Mary Allen sent shockwaves through the tight-knit community of Claymont. Residents were horrified that such a violent crime occurred in their midst, especially to someone as well-liked and respected as Mary. Her death left a void in the neighborhood, and her garden, once a vibrant symbol of her presence, now stood as a silent reminder of the life that had been so brutally taken. Vigils and memorials were held in her honor, with many community members coming together to support her family and call for justice. Despite efforts of law enforcement and outpouring of community support, the case grew cold over the years, with no significant leads or suspects emerging. Mary Allen's life and tragic death remain a poignant chapter in the history of Claymont. Her story is a reminder of the fragility of life and importance of a community. Though her killer was never brought to justice, Mary's memory lives on in the hearts of those who knew her and in the flowers that continue to bloom in her garden. A Strange But True Story by Drake S. In Sussex County, Delaware, there is a road with 13 curves. This is near the Broadkill River and Slaughter Beach. Yeah, I know great names, right? They were named that for a very, very legitimate reason. Rumor has it that the road that has 13 curves is because it goes around the burial grounds that are said to be there, and they're said to be incredibly haunted. These are 90 degree curves. People around here tend to stay off it after dark. I believe it was either Nanticoke Indians or Sequoia Indian tribes that inhabited this area. They were both here at one point, and I do believe they're still here now. Anyway, on to the way home from Philly on the 13th of September 2017. My daughter and her friend wanted to go down the road. They thought it would be fun to do the 13 curves on the 13th. 
Of course, I said okay. It was around 7.30 or 8 p.m. when we arrived. That's when it all started. I've been down that road before, so I know how to get there. It took me roughly 5, maybe 10 minutes to get to it. I thought it was a bit odd, but when we found it, it felt like the air went ice cold. So I had to put the heat on. Okay, no big deal. Coming up to the first curve, I look in the mirror and wonder where the car that was following us had came from. There had not been a driveway or a street or anything like that, and this car kind of just like popped up out of nowhere, but they were driving extremely fast. I looked back at the road, back at the mirror, and then the distance was cut in between us, like almost in half, like it was going so stupidly fast. It's like that Ninja Cat video, you know, the one where the person is recording his cat, hides behind the wall, looks back and the cat is closer, same type thing. This person is going to crash, I said to my daughter. I again looked back at the road, back in the mirror, and the headlights were at my bumper now. How fast does this guy even want me to go? Again, I looked at the road back in the mirror, and when I looked back, I had no idea where he went. It was like if he turned off or something like that, but we would have seen flashlights, headlights, whatever, you know, it was pitch dark out here. There are no street lights anywhere on this road. On the right, there were cornfields. On the left, there are trees with a salt marsh. Like, I was thinking maybe he had crashed or something like that, but I obviously hadn't heard any noises. Just then, three mists traveled opposite directions in front of the car. Two to the right and to the left, and one off to the opposite side of that. Okay, at this point it's time to get out of here. But I couldn't really see out the windshield very well. It wouldn't be clear with the wipers and fluid, it just for some reason was dark. The more I used the wipers, the worse it seemingly got. Now we're all starting to freak out. We finally left that area and it took us about 15 minutes to get out of there. No matter how far we went, we ended up back at the 13 curves. Now mind you, I don't ever get lost. So my daughter pulls out her GPS and tries to get us out and the GPS just kept taking us back to 13 curves. Now this is getting a little too freaky for me to handle. I finally found an area I knew and started driving back toward the highway, or so I thought. Guess where we ended back up? Yep, 13 curves, once again, back to the GPS. We looked for any route to get to the highway, and it says that we're going back to the 13 curves every single time. Something said just keep going straight, and then eventually we got to the highway and the GPS seemingly was accurate again. I'm not really sure what was going on, but it was definitely a very creepy time. Now I can tell you this, it was about 65-70 degrees, so it was a rather pleasant night. It was out in the rural area of Delaware, and I can't tell you much more than that. Don't Touch the Shadows by Night Tales My story takes place at my grandma and grandpa's house. As for a little backstory, the house was built in 1943 in an old neighborhood. It was one floor with three bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, a living room, a porch, and a gigantic backyard. The three rooms were down a long and narrow hallway, which always creeped me out. My grandparents' room was at the very end, and my room, which later became the laundry and guest room, was right across from it. Then there was Nikki's room, my older cousin who was 11 years older than me, across from the bathroom. At the start of the hall was the living room, and in the front was the kitchen. I was about 4 years of age at the time, I'm 14 now, so I was afraid of the dark. I had to use the restroom in the middle of the night, so I grabbed my Disney Princess flashlight from my toy bin and headed down the hall. I got shivers from the AC my grandma had turned on. I finished my business, turned off the bathroom light, and clicked my flashlight on. I was right at the door frame, and something caught my eye. It was already blacker than the pitch black of the house, and it made it stick out. It was not the mistake of something shining off anything or a trick of positions. What I saw was a shadow of a person at the end of the hall. The exact end of the hall where my room was at. I was frozen with fear 
my heart pounding in my chest for what felt like an eternity, but was probably just a few seconds. The shadows started to fade, and I made a desperate run from my room. As I passed the spot where the being stood seconds before, I felt something grab my arm. I tripped over a toy, panicked, and jumped into bed, throwing the covers over my head as if it would be some sort of protection. That's the last time I got up in the middle of the night in the house. This lesson is for everyone who may be reading this and is sane enough to believe me. Never touch the shadows. Something in my room at night by Suspicious Seesaw. Recently, I moved into a new apartment, and for the first time, I'm having sleep paralysis. Whenever I feel presence, someone touches my side and my back with their fingers. I have abandoned my room, and I never really go in there unless I have to. It's not just because of this. Other things have also occurred. A couple of months ago, I was lying in my bed, and in the reflection of my TV, I saw a being about three feet tall standing and staring at me. As soon as I noticed it, in a strangely inhuman way, it ducked down incredibly fast and out of view. I immediately got up and looked under my bed. I could see nothing. This happened to me quite a few times when I was a child as well, not just when I was older. I was having a nightmare about a short, hooded figure about the size of a child. When I ran up to see what it was, I felt a sharp pain in my left side and woke up. When I opened my eyes, I saw a being in the darkness standing about a foot away from me, about three feet tall. After seeing it for a few seconds, it vanished into thin air as if it had never been there at all. While the sleep paralysis with it touching my back also happens to that same side I felt a sharp pain in when I was a kid that woke me up. As I had mentioned, it got so bad that I had to abandon sleeping in my room altogether. The last couple of nights I was in there, something terrifying happened. One night, I felt something kind of bothering me, and like it felt like something was almost getting up in the bed next to me, and like moving my mattress. I could feel its weight. The next night, I woke and I saw what looked like the hand of a child reaching up from under my bed in the reflection of my mirror trying to grab me. Well, this is where things get really scary. The next day, my roommate told me how his co-worker had a weird experience. A being reached up from under the line in a restaurant when he was closing alone and grabbed his leg. It then tried to do it again. He was always alone when this would happen, and there was no room for someone down there to hide. I didn't tell him what happened to me, and we had no contact with each other at all. Things like this have happened to me since I was just a kid. It doesn't matter where I go, it follows me absolutely everywhere. I don't know if it's one thing or multiple things happening to me. I've had more experiences where a man comes up talking to me and waking me up in the middle of a dream, or some sort of weird voice that I hear at the other end of the house. Another time it's somebody clapping their hands and weird rhythms and stuff like that, but I'm always home alone. Recently. Even though I've been sleeping in the living room with my cats, I've been woken up twice now by a voice talking directly in my ear. The last time it happened, it was so loud that it actually hurt my ear. One night I got drunk and uh, I was taunting it. I know it was a stupid idea, but I felt stressed and I was at the end of my rope. I told it that it was a coward for hiding and I would find it, and I laughed. Well. It yelled directly in my ear one morning, saying, Aren't you gonna laugh at me now? Things all over my home have been moving independently. Lights have been turning on and off. Cats are chasing and growling at something I cannot see. This is bizarre, but a couple of weeks ago when I was watching TV with my roommate, I saw something duck behind my mattress. I have been living in my living room for some time, but whatever it was, couldn't have been larger than a half a foot. What even is that small? When we got up to look, there was absolutely nothing there. I tore that room, limb from limb, piece by piece, looking for anything that could be hiding in there. There was nothing. Some people say it's hallucinations. Some people say it's just sleep paralysis. Some people say it's just paranoia. I couldn't tell you. 
It's important to note that I haven't been having just paranormal or supernatural experiences. I also saw what I believed to be a grey alien at one point. One night when I was walking home, around 2 in the morning, I saw a very tall, slender looking person with no clothes on, crouched behind some bushes right outside one of the bedroom windows of this house. It had a teardrop shaped head, massive black eyes, and it had barely any nose or mouth, no ears that I could tell, and it was roughly 8 to 8.5, maybe even 9 feet tall. There was another time that I woke up with my shirt on backward and blood in my mouth. I don't know if this was a paranormal experience, something to do with those aliens, or if I'm just overreading into all of this. Thank you for sharing my story, and I would love to know any thoughts in the comments down below. Creepy Whistling in Peabody Creek Trail by Zed the Second. Hello, this is about something I heard while hiking on the Peabody Creek Trail, and this show seems like they would enjoy it. I live in a relatively small city, around 20,000 people called Port Angeles, and we have Olympic National Park in our backyard. Near the park's visitor center, there is a half-mile trail that loops around to the visitor center. About halfway down the loop, there is a Peabody Creek Trail that loops off of that. It's about a two and a half mile long trail, 2.7 miles to be exact. Now, I'll admit, I'm not the most outdoorsy type, quite the opposite, and I'm the typical teen who stays inside all day gaming rather than hiking or camping or anything of that sort. But on the last day of school before graduation, one of my teachers gave my friends a list of hiking in the area. They invited me to go on one about a week or two ago, but I declined because there is no way I'm lugging my fat self around 8 miles up and down a mountainside. I decided to pre-game the hikes or go outside and hike some a little bit less intense trails in the area to get more in shape. Anyway, after canceling the hike, I loaded up my bag with water to adjust to carrying a heavyish bag up trails. I had little over a gallon of water split into five bottles, some jerky, dried fruits, and a couple of granola bars. I initially intended just to walk the half mile loop. Still, on the way to the visitor center, I saw something on the side of the road. Looking back, I was sure it was probably a warning that I should have followed. I live within walking distance, so I just walked to add in some more steps. On the side of the road was a dead cat. It looked like it had been there for a couple of days, maybe even a week. I kept walking down the road instead of taking that sign as some sort of hint. After 15 minutes of walking, I start the half mile loop which was uneventful but absolutely lovely. Once I made it to the trailhead for Peabody Creek Trail, I said something along the lines of, screw it, why not, and I started up the trail. I should preface that I got to the Peabody Creek Trail around 6.30pm, so the sun was about to start setting and I didn't bring a flashlight in case it got dark, because I'm not very smart. Now, Peabody Creek Trail is a lot rougher than the half mile loop that I was, I was just doing. Peabody Creek Trail is a lot of ups and downs with hills and stairs and a lot of steep stairs as well. While walking down the trail, I got the absolute crap scared out of me by some other people walking the trail the opposite direction, which was made much better the second I recognized one of them. It was a staff member from my high school and presumably his wife and dog. We chatted briefly about nothing in particular, as you do when you see somebody you know and let them pass briefly. After they passed me, I kept walking and noticed the bridge was out. This bridge was essentially just a log with boards attached to the top that crossed from the right side of Peabody Creek to the left side. The bridge had been snapped in half at the middle, across, not lengthwise, and had fallen into the creek. So you had to keep going up the trail until you found the next bridge. You'd have to climb down almost a sheer face and drop about seven feet down, which wasn't that crazy, but pretty hard for people who were immobile. Thankfully, it's a shallow creek at the very least if you had to go through it. I should have taken the bridge being out as a sign to turn around and go home. Because I continued to go on the trail in front of where I was looking. 
around these curves that went around a massive hill, and it keeps going forward again after that. I began to hear strange whistling sounds to the left of me, maybe about a hundred feet up the trail. It was two short notes, one lower, one higher. It was definitely a man's voice, so it was probably the guy who had passed me whistling for his dog earlier. At least that's what I thought. Then I heard the whistle again, except this time it was slightly closer and coming from directly before me. It was the same two notes, with no differences, none at all. Usually when you whistle or do anything with your voice, there are minor fluctuations you can hear, slight differences each time. This was robotic and perfect. It was like someone had recorded the first whistle and played it back, and then recorded the second one and played that one back. Then I heard the same whistle again, only closer and about 45 degrees to my right. Right then, I was hit with some weird thing. It was like an overwhelming dread that I shouldn't be there. Like, I need to get out of there as quickly as possible. And then I heard the same whistle again on my direct right. All of the whistles happened in about a 15 second period and spanned a distance of at least 500 feet. Impossibly fast for a human being. Mainly because the last three whistles were for sure from off trail. As soon as I heard the fourth whistle, I did a 180 and started getting out of there as fast as I could absolutely booking it and almost jumping over the creek entirely. Once I thought I would be out of earshot, I began to run and kind of whimper a little bit, even faster. I know I said I was sprinting, but when I say I went faster, I was absolutely tiptoeing it out of there as fast as possible like a sprinter. Now, I'm not necessarily a paranormal skeptic or a believer, and I'm not really one to jump to paranormal explanations immediately. I prefer a mundane explanation so I don't have to freak myself out and be scared to go hiking anymore. But I can't explain this experience. This experience is something that I've never really ever thought could happen. Uh, somebody could set up some system to play back the whistle or whatever. It could have just been an incredibly fast person. But I never saw anybody either. That's the part that really freaks me out. Creepy Walmart Coworker by Elysium G2. I've worked at Walmart for three years and I've seen my fair share of weirdos. It's just something that comes with the territory. However, one person I met who worked there is the closest I've ever known to true evil. This story isn't like something out of a horror movie but rather an example of how the scariest things can be the real life monsters that lurk around us every single day. I've changed the names in this story for anonymity. To give some context, I'm a 24-year-old girl and I've received unwanted attention from several older men over my years at Walmart. It's uncomfortable, sure, but usually I can brush it off and avoid them. This all changed for me that day that Andrew started working there. Andrew was in his mid-30s. I immediately sensed something was off with him the first time he spoke to me. He seemed overly friendly and flirty, as a guy would say to a girl when he had an ulterior motive. I tried to make it seem like I wasn't interested and clearly showed that with my body language and the way I spoke to him. He asked me for my name, which I had to give him since it was on my name tag and we were co-workers after all. After our interaction, I thought, I'll just try to avoid him from now on. Unfortunately for me, I couldn't avoid him. We didn't work in the same department, but I would encounter him often while walking through the back room and the sales floor. I could feel his eyes on me every time I walked past him. I just had this intense gut feeling to stay away from this guy. One day, I had to go down the aisle where Aaron Drew was stalking some certain items. This was a very narrow aisle, and I didn't want to be alone with him. When he saw me, he immediately started up a conversation. He asked me when my birthday was and wanted to know how old I was turning. I told him I'd be turning 25, and he seemed in disbelief. I've always told him I look younger than I am, and my braces didn't help any. His shock about my age set off a major red flag. Did he want me to be younger or something? Did he want me to be underage? Another time, the two of us were alone in an aisle, and Andrew asked me if I lived alone. Again, this is an immediate red flag. 
I told him that I didn't and I had multiple roommates. He then prodded for more information. When I told him that I lived with a big male friend, he asked if I was dating him, and I told him no, I'm not dating my roommate. He said his heart sank when I told him I lived with a man. I wanted to roll my eyes. While talking to other female co-workers, I learned they also got creepy vibes from Andrew. He treated many young women who worked in the store the same way. One night I was on Facebook and saw his profile in the People You May Know section. Being curious, I clicked on his page and in one of his recent posts he said he had been in jail at one point. This piqued my interest, so I googled his name and I felt my stomach drop as I read the headline that popped up. Man charged with S.A. of a 12-year-old girl. Upon clicking the article, I saw his mugshot. It was him. The neck tattoos matched in everything. Except for one thing. Andrew wasn't his real name. The article named him as Jeremy. He must have changed his name in an attempt to hide his past. My heart was beating out of my chest as I realized that I, along with my co-workers and friends at Walmart, had been targeted by an actual predator. The next day I told my manager I feared Andrew and mentioned the article I found. Several weeks later I learned that Andrew had been fired. The reason? A 17-year-old employee reported that he was making inappropriate comments towards her. He was also found drinking on the job. Doing the math, he has a 12-year-old victim and multiple other victims that were either between the ages of 17 and 18. All I can hope is that she finds peace. I was visiting my girlfriend and her family in Lawrence, Kansas for the holidays when we decided to go to Stull Cemetery one night. It was about 20 minutes away from her home. Her father always likes to go exploring and her parents are night people, which I love. So every day, none of us would go to bed until about 5 a.m. the following day. The night we decided to go, we left around 4 a.m. and her mother chose to stay in. Her father, my girlfriend, and I decided to go to Stull. We parked next to the church across the street from the cemetery. I was already a little nervous as her dad warned us about the town not allowing people into the cemetery very often, and they're fairly hostile. There is a cop usually posted up there to ensure no one trespasses onto the cemetery, but luckily there was no cop this time. When we stepped out of the car, the silence felt heavy, like a weight in the air. It was holding back even the wind. We left the car and crossed the street. To my surprise, there was no fence to jump over or even a gate. The entrance was wide open, and we walked right through. We passed some of the graves and visited a few. I wonder how recently some of the graves were made as the ground felt spongy beneath us. It was dark and we didn't want to attract much attention, so flashlights weren't being used, so we had to do the most with the streetlight. Passing the graves, we passed this lone, contorted, dead tree at a bend that took us up the hill. At the top of this hill sat the rubble of the church that used to reside there. According to my girlfriend's dad, the town tore down the church in the 90s because hundreds of people would go and vandalize the property at all points of the year, especially in Halloween. According to the local legend, if you threw a glass bottle at the back of the church wall and it didn't break, Satan would appear and drag you to hell. Anyway, the rubble of this church was still there. We walked around it, on it, and moved stuff around looking for anything exciting. Anything like a trinket or maybe even a sign from the paranormal. We found nothing but these weird scratches on some of the stones along the front perimeter of the rubble. Too organized to be an animal, but it could have been some kids fooling around. We looked around for about 20 or 30 minutes, went behind the church toward the creepy looking dead trees, and went around some of the brushes, and went around some of the bushes surrounding the perimeter. Because it was so quiet, we couldn't hear a car coming from a couple of miles away. Because it was so quiet, we could hear a car coming from miles away. So we would once again turn off our flashlight to ensure we would not be seen. After a while, my girlfriend found an unbroken glass bottle lying on the grass in front of the perimeter of the church. It was an empty Corona beer bottle. I immediately thought it would be funny to pick it up and place it along the back perimeter of the church, where the wall was, and then throw it and see if it would break. She called her dad and me over, and so we went. And when she saw that I was going to bend over and pick up the bottle, she turned away. 
Later, she told me she couldn't believe I would touch the glass bottle. Her dad was to the left of me, pointing a flashlight at the bottle, and my girlfriend was behind me. And the second I touched it and picked up the bottle, we heard a strange sound. It sounded like gas or fizzing. The bottle was empty, though. And it sounded like it was coming from 15 feet or so away, towards the back of the rubble. Immediately, her dad and I pointed our flashlights toward the sound and saw nothing, but maybe three seconds after the fizzing noise, we heard a weird gargling sound and some clipping. It sounded like some sort of creature, but I couldn't identify what it was possibly. Her father later told us that he had been in Kansas all of his life and had never heard a sound like that. Stranger still was that if it was some sort of animal or fauna, don't you think it would have been freaked out and ran away from all the noise we were making? We never found the source of the sound. After holding the bottle for a little while, searching for the sound, and hearing my girlfriend say that she couldn't believe I picked it up, I finally dropped the bottle and took a couple of photos, most of which I don't think I have access to anymore. We then made our way back to the car, certainly spooked out, and when we got back to the car, the lights were on inside the vehicle, when we definitely left them off. We could see it in the distance as we approached it, the only light source in a sea of darkness. We got to the car, checked all the doors, and they were all indeed locked and closed. I thought maybe one of us had left the door open. When we got inside the car, something just felt creepy and off and static. No one remembered turning on these lights or anything on the contrary. But we remembered turning them off because my girlfriend's dad was changing the batteries in one of the flashlights before we even got to Stoll. Well, that was our experience. I'm curious to see if anyone has any similar experience in Stoll Cemetery or otherwise. When I was still young, maybe six or seven, my folks got the great idea of converting our garage into a family and game room. This was the 80s. The concept of the family game room was becoming popular, primarily because of the rise of arcades and the availability of having arcade games and consoles like the Atari 2600 to the consumer market. It was indeed a fantastic time to be a kid. Although my parents often used the garage to store things, my dad grew tired of being unable to watch TV because my brother and I constantly were playing video games. He had seen a conversion, a neighbor who had decided that this would be the best way to get his television back. First, he traveled to a local hardware superstore and purchased a steel shed to make up for the storage space he'd be losing. Along with a six-pack of Miller High Life, he spent a few days putting it up in our backyard. Despite falling in on himself within a year, he seemed pleased with his work. His next step was to find a company to do the conversion for a fair price. He called every company in the phone book, but they wanted more than he wanted to pay. After asking around, a friend recommended a group of guys who had remodeled his kitchen for dirt cheap. Since my dad was a first-class cheapskate, these were the guys for him. After much haggling, they were contacted and dad hired them for the job. My dad was in such a hurry to regain control of the TV that he couldn't wait until the spring to start the renovation. As a result, the guys could use the space heaters to be comfortable working in the Kansas winter. From the start, these guys were nothing but trouble. When they did show up at the house, which was very rarely, they did very little and often called it a day by 3 p.m. My dad had to call several times to complain. Once or twice, he even had to make them redo some piece of shoddy work. If I remember right, my mother tried to get him to fire the guys and hire a new company, but regardless of all the headaches, my dad was a miser to the bone. Eventually, he would be forced to get a new set of contractors. However, this was only because a near-deadly disaster would force him to. One night, Billy, my little brother, and I would be put to bed just like any other evening. At some point, my mother would shake me awake in the middle of the night. She was yelling and had a very panicked look on her face. I slowly started to rise when I began to smell smoke. My mother was next to the door yelling at my brother. It wasn't long before the smoke caused me to start choking and coughing. I remember putting on my robe when my mother ran back into my room carrying Billy on her shoulder. I don't think he was even awake yet really. She pushed me out of the room and we ran down the hall toward the front door. My dad was standing in the foyer. He must have been waiting for us. By then, the house had filled with thick black smoke, but I couldn't see any fire. This changed once we all made it out to the front lawn. 
I stood with the rest of my family watching the flames engulfing the house and illuminating the neighborhood. Fire trucks arrived a minute later, and we all got checked out by the paramedics. They fought the fire for over an hour, but the house was already done for. We would be living in a motel for the next six months or more. About a week after the fire, Dad got the report that stated it had been started by a faulty space heater in the garage. I can only imagine how furious he was to read this. This still didn't stop him from wanting to hire a Yahoo back to rebuild the house. My mother put her foot down at this point. However, when she threatened to take Billy and me and move in with her parents, my dad folded and hired a reputable company to do the job. I'm suspicious that he only chose them because he wasn't paying for them. The check from the insurance company did cover all the costs, luckily. He probably would have found another group of cowboy builders to do the job and keep the extra money if he could, but I don't think he thought of that. I love the man, but Jesus. The work was completed relatively quickly. My parents chose to have the new house rebuilt in almost the same design as the original. The significant difference was the construction of a large game room at the back. The family would spend most of our next 10 years there, even dad. The garage was put back to work storing things and the shed was left to collapse. There's still a big pile of rusty steel all these years later. I thought I'd share this story about something a friend and I saw years and years ago while cruising the back roads of Kansas late at night. And maybe you can use it in an upcoming video. My friend and I were young adults around 2007 and 2008 in a small town with nothing much to do. So one summer between college semesters, we decided to explore the back roads of our part of the state at every chance. We spent much time driving down those dirt roads. Our favorite route wound through the country roads of a town near the Oklahoma border, twisting through the Jip Hills and taking us through a few ghost towns along the way. We'd set out late on this night and hadn't gotten to our route yet until maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. We must have taken a wrong turn onto a previously unexplored road because we quickly noticed that we were lost. We were chatting up a storm and sipping on our tea before we even realized this though. I was riding as a passenger looking out the window into the darkness of the Kansas summer night. Not much to see but endless stars overhead. I can't remember what we were talking about at the time, probably our future or something. But as we cruised at about 45 miles down the dirt road, I saw something that startled me. Up ahead, caught by the headlights of my friend's car, I saw a shape stand up tall alongside the road. My friend saw it too, pumping the brakes. Initially, I thought it was a deer, a widespread feature of the Kansas landscape. And it was about the right size to be a deer. It was only about four to five feet tall if I had to guess. Whatever it was, it turned to look right at us, and its eyes lit up in a glare of the headlights. They were bright red, almost, almost crimson. As soon as it looked at us, it darted across the road at an inhuman speed. That's when we realized this was no deer. Neither of us got a good look at what it was, and moved away way too fast, but the details we could agree on were that it was relatively tall, four or five feet tall, covered in dark fur, and was running on two legs. We sat there in the middle of the road looking at each other for a moment, with that WTF expression on both of our faces. And when my friend decided to goose it and get out of there, we hauled down that dirt road far away from whatever the heck that thing was. We couldn't stop speculating. What the hell was that thing? My friend suggested it was a chupacabra. I threw out maybe a small Bigfoot. Whatever it was, it was extraordinary. Neither of us had ever seen it. And what happened next was just as bizarre. Heading towards us at roughly 1.30 a.m. on a summer night, about 30 miles from the nearest inhabited town was a pair of headlights. Nothing too odd about that really at first glance, even though we were way out in the sticks. There were still farms. The vehicle caught up to us quickly. He had to have easily doubled our speed, maybe about 75 to 85 miles per hour. As he roared past us, we noticed the vehicle details. A large, late model white SUV. Not the farm truck you'd expect. And why was he going so fast? He was going way too fast to make out a plate. Weird, we thought. Chalk it up to another one of the weird and high strangeness events that we would encounter in this area. 
But that still wasn't all. As soon as his headlights disappeared into our rearview mirror, back in the direction we had just seen the thing, no less than a fresh set of headlights appeared ahead. This vehicle was also screaming at us. As it passed us, we noticed that it had the same model as the last car. It was another large white SUV. Another vehicle followed shortly behind that one, as if that wasn't creepy enough. This time, it was a large white van. It looked new, and it was hauling ass. My friend and I don't talk anymore, but we both witnessed something strange in the middle of nowhere Kansas that night. What was that thing we saw? And what were those three big white vehicles heading in its direction? Thanks for reading my story and keep up the great show.